you. Hopefully I can live up to that bio. <laughs> Look, thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here today. I was actually sharing earlier that I have quite a passion for ag and veterinary science and also animal science because although my PhD was in obstetrics and gynaecology and my model organism was pigs and I actually spent a year and a half in a veterinary school over in Milan. So I've always sort of had that, that linkage and then later when I first got into communications, I was at the University of Adelaide and we had a very strong um, agriculture and veterinary sort of science presence. So I guess for me they've always very much been part of you know the, the complex puzzle that is communicating science. So look today I, I'm not going to go too heavily on the whole agricultural and animal science side of things because all of you sitting in this room really are the experts in that and what messages you're trying to get across. Instead I'd like to talk to you about the tools and the ways that you know I believe that we can convince the media and the broader audiences on social media about our messages and about the, the work that we all represent. So as I wait, make my way around the country talking to various people, one of the biggest responses that I get from people is, oh, media, especially scientists, a lot of them say, why should I talk to a journalist and why should I put myself out there, especially when it's controversial or contentious topics? So, you know, when we're talking GMO or anything that could potentially be taken the wrong way. Now, a lot of these are probably the worst possible headlines I could put up on the screen, and most of them have come from the UK, where the tabloid culture is much, much, you know, uh, alive and well than it is in Australia. I'm happy to say that the majority of journalists here really try very hard to represent what we're saying the right way. However, I can understand why people get concerned and why people go, oh, I don't know that I really want to, you know, tell them what I'm doing at the moment. So this also comes at a time where we've got a real problem and there's a lot of fake news around. So some of it is just so completely fake that there's sites like this one cropping up. So it's um, an ABC News site with the URL abcnews.com.co instead of com. And that is actually a site that is 100% fake news. Their whole reason for being is to put interesting stories about all sorts of topics out there that are completely, you know, pretend and fake. Now, so that, that's, you know, one of the issues that we are challenged with and at the moment there's about 80 different sites doing things like this. Either they do it as satire or some of them just want to see how far their fake news gets. The other um, issue that we have, of course, is misreporting of research. The research might be done the right way, but somebody, you know, often meaning well, reads that research and takes off with it and talks about it on radio or TV and kind of gets the wrong angle on what we're really trying to say. <laughs> what that can mean is a lot of work for scientists and regulatory bodies to try and turn the tide back to what the research really meant. Often it's things like just one small study in, you know, 12 or 40, um, you know, different trials, um, well not trials but an N of 40 sort of thing and somebody will blow up a great big headline about that, you know, it's only 40 times I've tried it where, you know, when for it to actually be significant we really should be looking often 2,000 times or 4,000 times depending on the situation. So they're the sorts of things that often journalists not meaning to do anything wrong go, oh well there's a paper and there's a p-value and this is correct but there's a lot more to reporting science than all of that. And so I feel that's why we all have to help with this and make sure that we're getting the messages out there the right way. So the other thing, you know, back to that question of why should we bother with media, um, well we still know that the general public, the, the best way they find out about uh, news is still mainstream media. TV is still doing extremely well when it comes to how people tune in and learn their news and the things that they believe they know about science and ag and animal science is coming from that. Social media is very close, it's actually really, really creeping up on television uh, and probably in the next couple of years we will see more people getting the news from social media and platforms like Facebook than we will actually see them getting it from TV. But what this means is if this is where people are getting their info, this is where we all need to be with the right information for them. The other thing is that scientists get their news from the media too and they often get their ideas of how to collaborate with people and what sort of things they should be looking at. Um, so, you know, we do know that it can really help the amount of citations and article downloads that scientists get just by either being on the news or really talking about their findings on the radio or something like that. 
However, having said all those wonderful things about media, and I've already given a little bit of an insight into it, the media landscape is changing really quickly and really rapidly. In the last few years, we've lost well over 2,000 journalists from media in Australia, which is a huge amount. When I say journalists, I'm talking about producers, sub-editors, all the people who used to help get together the newspaper, the, the news bulletin on the, the nightly news. Those that are left are very time poor, they're overwhelmed, they're looking for a quick way to get that story. Sometimes that means they won't cover science because it's too hard, too complex and they can't actually get their head around it. Or if they do, that's where there's that huge risk that they're going to introduce you know, errors and problems like that. So, you know, they're, they're in this situation where they've got just no time and, and no help. The other thing is we've seen a huge decrease in the number of specialists in the media. So once upon a time you'd have a health reporter, an environment reporter, a science reporter, sometimes you'd have a couple of those things or a little team that was working on that. Now there's whole parts of our country, like in Western Australia, the last time I checked, there isn't actually an official science reporter there for any of their main uh, you know, their main media outlets. That's a real concern because we're trying to talk to people who are covering everything from sport. Uh, you know, they might be a medical scientist and we're trying to talk to them about pesticides and ag. Well, I guess with pesticides, a health reporter might know what they're on about. But, you know, for some of the other things, it's a real concern. So because of all these changes, based on the fact that, you know, advertisers aren't investing in media, so media's got less money and they're firing people left, right and centre, more and more of uh, the journalists are actually using social media to source their stories and to verify their stories. So you'll see that about 80% of Australian journalists are on at least three types of social media, most of them are on more than that, and they're using that every week. They use it both to send out their media articles now. So, you know, once upon a time you might have just read that article in the newspaper, now they um, send it out on Facebook and Twitter. So they write it for the media outlet, but it goes out much broader. And it's also used as a source of that breaking news. So probably today they were having a look at the hashtag for this day and just seeing whether there was anything topical or interesting and whether someone could turn it into a quick online article. The other thing is that these days on social media, um, there's much more chance that uh, scientific conferences will be turned into a media story. And those journalists will shop around and see something really quirky and interesting. And this is an example. This was about mosquitoes. Um, the guy who was there was for mosquito studying, but then he saw someone else presenting about spiders. So he wrote a little message about that. And next thing, there was a, an article in The Age. So really it makes a lot more sense to think about your whole online presence than just thinking about media or social media. So whenever I'm trying to do something, I think about, okay, now what actual media hits can we get? And then I think about, okay, and how do we use social media to drive that out broader and find the right influences and the right people who will help us share this story. And for me, personally, for my career, it's been huge, you know, getting, getting the opportunity to be on live talk about radio and meet various people in, in major media outlets. It, it gives you a huge opportunity to tell them about the message that you want to put out there. So then let's move to the social media side of things. The next thing I get from scientists is, oh, social media, that's even scarier than the media because we have no control, you know, someone might stalk me or what I put out there might be completely misrepresented. And look, there's reason to be concerned because things do happen on social media, but quite frankly, if, if it's treated the right way and we're very cautious about the way we use social media, there's no reason we can't use that for the right reasons. The other thing is a lot of people say, well, even if it is a great tool, I have no time. I, you know, it's time consuming, why should I care about this? Well, in that sense, you don't want to be on every social media platform. You want to pick things that might work well for either your science or for a regulatory reason and communicate within a community of people that you actually care about. So working out what you're trying to do, who you're trying to reach and only really playing on those platforms. For example, you might not want to be on Snapchat chatting to a stack of 17 year olds when the people that you want to reach are on Twitter and they're from government departments, just to you know, put that out there. 
So there's been a lot of um, papers just starting to emerge about social media and science and people actually doing some research to see what sorts of effects it has. And certainly they're seeing that Twitter seems to be a really important one for science. Um, so basically getting mentioned on Twitter and getting your research put out there um, means that more people acknowledge you, that more people are downloading your papers and it's being very heavily associated with things like promotions and, and getting along further in scientific careers. Here at University of Canberra, um, they actually did a really interesting study and it's one I recommend people to have a look at. It's academics um, across all different disciplines, but they asked them all about their social media use and there's a, a stack of really good personal um, sort of recounts of how social media has helped people or anything they need to be concerned about. But really what comes across is for academic reasons and for, you know, spreading research news, really Twitter is still one of the best platforms for this. So just very briefly, and there's a whole article on this, um, but the reasons to use social media for, for our sort of purposes are one, it allows us to control the message. You're, you're basically publishing your own little micro blog to say exactly what you want to say about that thing you're commenting on. It allows you to broaden your networks. So you can be having a chat to the other regulatory bodies and the people involved in that all around the world. You know, there are no borders when it comes to social media. So it might be someone in the Netherlands, it might be somebody in America that are picking up what you're saying and have something to add to that conversation. It allows you to keep up with the latest research and news from those areas in anything you're interested in. It allows you to promote your paper or your research to help people understand your science that aren't sort of from the scientific field. So that might be a journalist or you might want to put more on Facebook and have a broader audience who don't usually necessarily have an interest in science as a discipline but find what you're doing and find it very interesting. Like that moth video would have definitely done very well on social media. <laughs> so I was looking at that taking notes. Um, it's also a great avenue to correct misinformation. So if people are out there really having a go about things like pesticides or about something in ag and they're wrong, if they've got it completely inaccurate, that's really an opportunity for people to correct that message and provide them with the papers or the evidence that allows you to correct that. Um, it's a place to share interesting things. It enhances research. It's, I, I find it easy and inexpensive. And really, it's very fun. So, you know, as I was saying, used in moderation. You don't need to put out 20 tweets a day. You might only put three things out a week or you might use it to gather information. It can be a very powerful tool. So the other thing I encourage um, folks when I, I often go around and talk to scientists and the way scientists get trained to write and having been on both sides of the fence I can really relate to this is you're encouraged to give kind of the introductory background and then go into um, you know the methods that you've used and, and the various things you looked at and then come up with the conclusion and the reason why that paper was you know so interesting or so good so even your abstract if you think about that it tends to at the end to get to the big point Media and social media, they just flip that whole triangle on its head. They want to know, what's the headline? What have you really done? Why should I care? Why will it affect me? You know, is there an animal dying? Does it mean we're not going to have any bees? Why, why does that really matter to me? Then you can tell me a bit about how you've done that, why your study was better than someone else's or it's new or it's novel. And then finally, if you've got some other background information, then put it down the bottom. So um, this is a really good website that I highly recommend to all of you in this room. It's free. You go on to sciencemediasavvy.org and it's got all sorts of little training videos about using social media or about dealing with the media. It's also got a contentious science topic and if you contacted the organisation that runs that, they would give you access to use that. And I think for this area, there'd be a lot of very good um, sort of learnings from that. They keep it a little bit locked up for a very good reason because they don't want the fake news folks to, <laughs> to get hold of it. Um, but I highly recommend having a look on there. It's got all sorts of tip sheets and examples of exactly how you can get this to work for you. Uh, and then just very quickly, I was going to mention a couple of things about getting started. Just as a show of hands, who in this room is already on social media? About half, okay. So for those on there, this is probably, you, you know all of this, but for those not, no matter what the platform is that you pick, 
One thing is make sure you've got a photo. It doesn't have to be the most stunning photo of you ever, but people need to be able to recognise you, whether that's to connect with you on LinkedIn, whether that's to know that it's you on Twitter or Facebook, but, but try and keep that professional. Um, the other thing is just making sure when you post about things, so say you want to give a message about pesticides or moths, making sure that you're actually putting a picture or a video up with that. Um, the, there's a huge rate compared to people who put something with a photo, we all click on a photo or a video, compared to us just reading something with text. And the other thing is making sure that you really say what your thing is and stick to that thing on your social media. So, you know, for me, I say I'm all about communications and outreach, and I have been in the not too distant past doing heaps of arts reviewing. So I made sure on my Twitter profile people understood that from me you'll get a crazy mix of kind of science and arts and all of these things so they, they know what they're in for. You know, if they want to follow me, that's what I talk about. I'm not going to suddenly come in with something completely unrelated on the side. And then finally, if you um, want to get started and you, you haven't got a, a profile yet or you want to make your profile go better, Picking key influencers in your field. So all your chief scientists, you go in and you see who they're following. Follow them. <laughs> and you go to anyone you respect in your field. Go in and see who they're following and who's following them. And that's just an a automatic way to get yourself a really nice community of people who are probably the ones that you want to be influencing. And then when you start, you, you can just start by watching. Then you can start by just retweeting something that you agree with, something that you think's worthwhile. And then eventually, once you feel comfortable on the platform, you can start composing your own tweets. I won't go into all the little you know, ways to do that with the um, what they call the handles, which is the at and the hashtags, which is the topic. But for those of you who aren't already engaged, do look at that science media savvy unit because it will tell you stacks about that and how to do it. So just to sum up, Hopefully, after this, everybody's really keen to engage. Um, so the, the key things I just remind everyone of, first of all, just what is your thing and stick to your thing. Perhaps don't go commenting outside of your field if that's just you know not anything that you have a relationship with. It might be an opinion, but just try and stick to the thing you know a lot about and is your evidence basis. Start promoting your science and your expertise on social media. I, I highly recommend Twitter for research. I just think it's a good platform and it doesn't attract the same amount of sort of junk posts and things that some of the other sites do now. Um, I recommend you follow influential sites and people on social media and participate where you can on online and social chats such as the Ag Chat Oz. That's a really good one that you can propose topics that you want all the agricultural community to chat about and you know sort of engage online that way. And finally, um, always talk to your media team or your comms folks, and I know there's one of them sitting down front here who I just met before. <laughs> um, make sure you do talk to the people in your organisation because, you know, A, they're there to help you and advise you, um, but also if you've got something slightly contentious, you just want to make sure that you're going about it in the right way. And probably when I was talking about all those tip sheets and things, every government organisation and group has their own sort of online uh, rules and regulations, so it's always worth just checking on that before you get started. So that's it from me, and I'm not sure if we want questions or just go to panel. Panel, thank you.